So um, let's do a specific example of a constructing a hypothesis test. Okay, let's suppose that the x's are iid normal mu sigma squared, okay, and sigma squared is known. Uh, the hypothesis, our null hypothesis that we want to test is that mu is equal to zero. The alternative is that mu is equal to one, okay? So as was pointed out earlier, this is maybe, this is a little non-standard and maybe a little non-realistic because we're only allowing for the possibility that mu is equal to zero or one. We're not allowing for any other possibilities. But as I said before, this is a much easier case to analyze and for us to sort of understand what's going on, okay? So let's first think about the case where our sample size is small. We only have two observations. What kind of sample would lead you to believe the null or doubt the null in favor of the alternative? What do you think? Both are zeros, then it is null. And yeah. Okay, keep in mind that these are, that these are uh, random draws from a normal mu sigma squared distribution. So they don't have to both be exactly equal to whatever the mean is. Okay, they're from a normal mu sigma squared distribution. Yep. Yeah. So, so you're one step ahead of me. You're thinking about uh, characterizing the critical region in terms of the sample mean, um, and that that's exactly the right direction to go into. But let's think of it a little bit more broadly first. Let's just think about the region of the x1, x2 plane, for which we'd want to reject the the null in favor of the alternative. Basically, it's going to look like this, right? We're going to draw a diagonal line, which is equal to x1. The, the line is x1 plus x2 is equal to some value k. OK, we haven't specified what k is yet. And everything, if our sample falls above that line or sort of to the northeast of that line, we're going to want to reject the null, OK? That, that just means that our two uh, you know, sort of our two observations are kind of large. So that's going to tell us, ah, they probably didn't come from a mu equals zero distribution. And anything below that line, we're going to want to accept the null because, well, those are pretty small values and yeah, it probably didn't come from a mu equals one distribution. Okay? So we'll get back to how to choose k in a second. That's, a, that's sort of an important piece. But for now, let's just say that there's some constant k, and that's going to divide our, the, the sort of um, where our sample lives into two, uh, two regions. Okay? So we, equivalently, we can do this. And actually, well, you're two steps ahead of me, because <laughs> I'm first going to say that equivalently we could, instead of thinking about the, X, the x1, x2 space, we can just think about forming the sum of x1 and x2. That's going to be a, exactly equivalent to what I just put up. But maybe it's easier to think about just forming this sum and rejecting for large values of the sum and not rejecting for small values. Okay? It's exactly equivalent to the picture above. And also equivalent to the picture is instead of forming the sum, form the sample mean. Okay? So uh, in this case, if we want to keep the same um, procedure, we would this, uh, this sort of k value would get divided by 2 because the sample mean is divided by n, and n is equal to 2. Okay? So does everyone understand how these three, so all three of these ways of thinking about defining the critical region for a hypothesis test are equivalent, and they're going to result in identical procedures. And does this make sense? We get large values of our sample, we want to reject the null. Small values, we want to accept the null. Okay, so do we prefer one of these three ways of thinking about a hypothesis test over the others? Not really, but uh, as n gets big, then my ability to draw, you know, an n-dimensional sample space sort of, you know, deteriorates very quickly. So it just makes, you know, obviously if, well, I'll just say that, it, that uh, we'll, we'll probably want to just, you know, focus on one of these two and typically we'll focus on this one. But I just want to make the point that these three ways of thinking about defining the critical region are all equivalent. Okay? 
Okay, so we'll base our testing procedure on the test statistic. We'll call, we'll call this sample mean now the test statistic, okay? And sometimes we'll denote it T. And in this case, our test statistic is just equal to X bar. And what we're going to do is reject for large values of X bar. We're going to reject the null for large values of X bar. So in other words, the critical region is going to take the form X bar greater than K for some K that we have yet to determine. How do we choose K? Well, I said a couple minutes ago, we're, we care about the probability of these two different kinds of errors. And intuitively, it makes sense that, that our choice of K is going to determine our probability of rejecting a true null and our probability of accepting a false null. Okay? So what have I done here? I have drawn the distribution of our test statistic under the null. So this, is, this test statistic has a normal, uh, a normal distribution with a mean, with a variance sigma squared over 2 and mean 0. Okay, because the, under the null, the mean is equal to zero. And then this is the distribution of the test statistic under the alternative. So it looks exactly the same, but it's shifted over one. It has mean one. Okay, so this is an important point. Is everyone on board with these two different distributions and where they came from? Okay, so I've drawn the distribution of the test statistic under the null and under the alternative. So the probability, so we set a some k here, okay, and we accept the null for values of our test statistic less than k, and so this red shaded part here is the probability of accepting a false null. How did we get that? This means, this is how the test statistic is distributed if the null is false, okay, and so this is the probability that our test statistic is less than k under that presumption, okay. What's the probability that we reject a true null? Well, the true null <coughs> means that our test statistic is distributed this way. And we reject the critical region means that, you know, the, the shape of the critical region is we reject um, the null for large values of x bar. So anything above k, this is going to be um, the probability that we're rejecting a true null. Okay, so you can see then what we do is as we move K, we increase uh, beta and decrease alpha or vice versa. Okay, so basically um, the choice of any one of alpha, beta, or K determines the other two. Oh, wait, that didn't, yes, that is true. Okay, choice of any one of those determines the other two. So if we set alpha to some particular value that's going to tell us what beta is given, you know, given a sample size, et cetera. Um, and it's also going to tell us where to set k. And then uh, the other sort of important point to make is that choosing them involves an explicit trade-off between the probability of type 1 and type 2 errors. So we choose k, we move it, type 1 error goes way down, type 2 error goes way up, or vice versa. Okay? So is that clear? Yep. Are disjoint they have that so there, the the parameters that the 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 parameter spaces that characterize H naught and H A are disjoint. That doesn't mean the distributions of the test statistics are disjoint. Yeah, good question. Okay.